gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you once again for giving us this opportunity to feast together upon your word. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is ignorant and foolish, but seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve again at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're going to continue on in our study in Revelation. I'm going to put something up here on the screen that I I thought that you might be interested in this. It's somewhat of a breakdown. It's my breakdown of uh, the book of Revelation uh, in three parts, three simple parts. I'll try to explain it um, uh, here. What you're looking at is the bl there's blue and red and purple. Those are the three sections or or uh, categories. Uh, in one through four uh, is is one section. Uh, the red is another section. The purple is another section. What you'll notice in this is the tribulation period, that which is more strictly deals with the judgments of God, the wrath of God during the 70th week of Daniel. You'll find it in chapters 5 through 18. 5 through 18. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment and explain what I mean by the seven round trips. Uh, the purple there actually deals with uh, the second coming of Christ to the end of the book. That would be uh, the last three chapters, chapters 19 through 21. And what I find interesting about this is, is that it is... Uh, As I mentioned in a previous video, it's it's sort of like as we go through the book and we see how the scenery changes from, uh, you know, one moment we'll be in heaven uh, and the next we'll be on earth. It'll show something that's taking place on earth and then it'll show something again that's taking place in heaven. And it goes back and forth like that. And what's interesting is that between five, chapters five and 18, it goes back and forth between heaven and earth. And it does that seven times. Uh, I'm, I'm going to call that seven round trips in, in John's vision. So I find that interesting. And, and uh, of course, uh, that's uh, uh, that seven round trips is, if you looked at that as a whole, that's 14. And uh, the, the chapters 5 through 18, that, that would be 14, 14 chapters, which is twice seven, which is... Uh, actually, uh, the, the rest of it, the blue and the purple, if you added up the chapters 1 through 4 and 19 through 21, uh, you're looking at seven, seven chapters. Seven chapters, blue and purple. Fourteen in red, which is twice seven. I just found that interesting. I know that's it's probably a whole lot of, of uh, useless information, but numbers wise, it does it does seem to have some uh, significance. I, I would say it's it's got we're dealing with a, a a book that deals heavily with numbers. In fact, uh, so I don't think it's a stretch to say that these numbers uh, uh, were not. Uh, I absolutely see these numbers as as having been. Uh, constructed, designed, arranged, just the chapters were arranged in such a way, uh, the whole entire book was laid out in such a divine way that these numbers, I don't see them as coincidences, and, and so I find that interesting. But more than that, I guess more, more importantly, uh, you see that the, the second advent there in purple, it goes all the way from the second advent to the creation of the new heavens and new earth. Uh, and so it's it's quite a simple breakdown. It kind of helps give you an idea of of how the book is broken down. Now we're going to begin chapter eleven, uh, and we're being told what this messenger, this this angel, uh, who who came down and, and established dominion over the sea and over the earth, uh, we're being told what he said. And uh, John is given. A reed or a rod, and he's told to measure th that temple. And as far as I'm concerned, it's a literal rebuilt temple. 
uh, the the inner sanctuary, but the outer court he's to leave out. There's no measuring of that. He's to measure the inner sanctuary, but not the outer court because that's been given to the Gentiles because they'll tread it underfoot for 42 months. Uh, this measuring relates to the holy places in the sanctuary, which symbolizes the people of God who come through the tribulation. It's, uh, it's interesting that we have the temple and we have the people of God that are in it, and then we have the Gentiles, but we know in this age there's no difference. There's no difference between the two. We're told clearly in Romans chapter 3, I believe chapter 3, that there's no difference between Jew, Gentile, uh, barbarian, Scythian, bond, or free, but we're all one in Christ. So, so here we have a clear distinction. We have an indication that something has happened and, and that there's now a change between, uh, there's a change uh, between the people of God and the Gentiles uh, or the nations, a separation that would seem to indicate a change in dispensation. Uh, dispensation simply meaning uh, uh, a section or a period of time in which God deals with man in, in some particular way. Uh, and I, I, I see that as proving that the rapture is pre-trib. Now, they are to tread underfoot the outer court for 42 months. 42 months. Now, I've pointed this out before. We need to remember that the church was a mystery. It was a mystery. The church is not in Matthew 24. A well-known passage that deals with the, the day of the Lord, the, the, subject of, in the subjects which we're dealing with, here, right here in this study in the book of Revelation. And yet, there's been un, untold, unknown thousands of sermons have been preached on, on how one, one will be taken and the other left and, and how that that's the rapture when the truth, folks, is that the, uh, the ones taken there are taken in judgment, not raptured. That's not a rapture passage or that the ones that are left enter alive into the kingdom to populate the kingdom. We just don't see the church in Matthew 24. And as, as I pointed out previously, you take away the mystery, you take away the church, and uh, all of a sudden now you've got Matthew 24 uh, and our study here in Revelation, the book of Revelation, closing in on one another. I don't know how to put it any simpler than that. And the flow of Scripture runs from Matthew 24 right into the day of the Lord here in Revelation. If you take away the mystery of the church. Okay? And so when you go to Matthew 24 and you read Matthew 24, it's talking about what we're seeing here in the book of Revelation. You know, that the wars and, and rumors of wars, you know, th these... These wars and rumors of wars, they follow the removal of the church, okay? And they begin the completion of the Jewish age. God's dealing with Israel in the, in the end days, the last days. Uh, that it's the same thing with the many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ. And I know that there's been people that have, there's been these really, you know, these nutcases that have done that. Folks, this is after the removal of the body of Christ. It's a li it's little wonder that many will claim to be Christ at that time. Uh, there'll be earthquakes around the world. Uh, uh, there'll be earthquakes in divers places. Well, the truth is that the number of earthquakes happening around the world hasn't changed in 300 years, folks. But prophetic teachers, they'll swear it's increased. Well, it hasn't. It hasn't. So we need to make that distinction. And we know Christ was cut off after 69 weeks, okay? Then followed by the mystery, the church age, 
followed by the 70th week of Daniel, where we read, And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. I believe that he, he's the beast that rises up out of the earth in chapter 13. Chapter 13, but we're not there yet. Scripture declares, contrary to popular opinion, that it is Christ who confirms his already... Please, please don't just write this off immediately. That's not what I've heard. That, that may be so or that may not be so. It's not that the Antichrist doesn't enter into a covenant with, and I hate to just say it in Israel in general, he does with the non-believing Jews, okay? But according to Daniel, it is Christ who confirms his already existing covenant with the many for one week. The many. That is, the, those, the believing Jews, the remnant, his people. He confirms that, that covenant. It's not a new covenant. It's, he confirms the, the already existing covenant with his people. For one week, that is the seven-year period. A, a literal last week of roughly seven years. And in the midst of that week, He, our Lord, who confirmed that covenant with His people, the believing Jews at that time, will cause the sacrifice. He will cause. Our Lord will cause the sacrifice to cease because, why? It's an abomination to Him. Since His Son was the final sacrifice, okay? While at the same time, non-believing Israel enters into a covenant of death and hell. I didn't make up those words. You'll read that in Daniel with the Antichrist. And I explained all this in a video several years ago. So there has to be a temple. There has to be an altar or this couldn't happen. It is, it is certainly not referring to the temple being destroyed in 70 A.D. These prophetic scriptures, folks, they look ahead, not backwards in time. You know, how can I make the 70th week seven, 70 years? How can I do that? How can I make it cover the time after the crucifixion of Christ until A.D. 70? You know, which is which is a well of a lot more than seven years, plus the fact that there is no covenant. I can't make it do that. So the Antichrist is going to make his own agreement with the non-believing Jews at this time, just like there are believing and non-believing Gentiles in our our age. Okay, there are believing and non-believing Jews in Israel today, and there will be non-believing and and believing and non-believing Jews in Israel after we're gone. Okay? There's always been that, that division. That, that there's always been the believers and non-believers. Uh, and, and I think if you could guarantee Israel's security, well, you know, they'd be thrilled to death. Just the, the population of Israel the Israelites the, today, the modern Jews, they'd be thrilled because their tax burden would be cut tremendously. You know, we pay a lot of money in our country for military equipment, for protection, but, but uh, as far as taxes go, we don't pay anything like the Israelis pay in taxes for that security. And if they had a guaranteed security, I think they'd sign any covenant. Uh, And why? Would, why? Because they don't believe in the Messiah. Because they made this earth their permanent abode. Uh, we read in Ezekiel chapter thirty-nine. Let's go up against the city with no fortification. Well, when, when did they get rid of forti uh, fortification? Well, they haven't. That's Psalm eighty-three. We ain't there. We're not there yet. But I think we are close. I do believe that. I, I suggest we keep our eye on Israel 
if, if we're going to look anywhere outside this book, well, first and foremost, I think we need to keep our eyes on this book. But if you want to, if you want to take a break and you want to look at, around you, if you're going to look around you at all, uh, I'd say keep your eye on Israel, not the United States or anywhere else. We read in Daniel 12, uh, you know, where, where Daniel said, uh, uh, you know, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, the angel said, go thy way, uh, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. You see the two, the two camps there, believers, non-believers. That too is speaking of the 70th week. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, many, many take and, and look at that as the, the Antichrist uh, takes away, the, stops the sacrifices of the Jews in the temple during the, uh, at the midpoint of the tribulation. That, that's from the time that the daily sacrifice, that is that which has continued, is taken away. That's us, I believe. I've done a number of videos on that. And I'm not alone in that. I believe that that is the church taken away, the living sacrifice that has continued up to this day. It's taken away. Uh, from that time until and, and the, when the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there'll be 1,290 days. 1290, 1290, that's to the midpoint. Okay? To the midpoint which also confirms, I believe, that, that we are that living sacrifice that's taken away. Because it, it, when it's taken away, we're not starting at the midpoint, 1290 days, okay? But it's, we, we have, it's the 1290 that leads up to the midpoint, okay? 1290 to the midpoint. Where that we then read, "Blessed is he who waits and cometh to cometh to the thirteen thirty five days." That's the midpoint to the kingdom. Midpoint to the kingdom thirteen thirty five, from the time we leave to the midpoint twelve ninety. This is how we're able to, to to get accurate numbers on 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 a, of days on any timeline. And then when we go, you know, beginning at a date. And we see where the, the, the dates along that timeline land. And we see that these dates are, are quite impressive. It's, it's, it's quite impressive to see the church leaving on, at, on a timeline starting at Pentecost 2021, May 17, 2021, and, and go the exact number of days to the second advent when Christ would return, which it gives us a date, which we didn't make up. It's just that's the number of days to that date, and we, and we, to our amazement, we see that that date just happens to be, according to Torah calendar, the date Adam was created where the Lord would return at the second coming on the date that Adam was created. That's impressive. I don't care who you are. <clears throat> and I have said over and over again, the timeline is bulletproof. Any timeline that we put out on this channel is bulletproof, okay? You can't dispute the dates, okay? Whether God's going to use that timeline is another story altogether. But you can't poke holes in it. I'm not going to put up a timeline, any timeline, I never have, that anyone could poke a hole in and say, you're wrong about those numbers. You're wrong about those dates. Okay? I'm not going to do that. I've never done that. I'll be very dogmatic and insistent that the, about the timeline, any timeline that we put up as being accurate because too much time has been devoted to making it, to making sure that it's accurate, okay? You're dealing with numbers, math that doesn't lie, and you're dealing with dates, many times related to historic events, which are, is based on history, which is fact, which, which is not a lie, okay? Now, that's, that's all I'm going to say about that. So, going on, continuing on here in our and looking at uh, chapter 11. Israel today, folks, is a country that's dominated by Gentile powers. Okay, and it's, and it's threatened by 
the powers of Ishmael. If you know your Bible, you know that to be fact. That's the powers that threaten Israel, not Obama or the Pope or the UN or, or the World Health Organization or, or any other such nonsense. But the seed of Ishmael, the Arab nations, folks, even in, in your lifetime, history itself has pointed this out to you, okay? Yet Christians still dream up all kinds of faces for Israel's number one enemy. It's not hard to, to figure out who Israel's number one enemy is, uh, besides Satan. They, these are powers that are dominated by Christianity's counterfeit, okay? You know, also amazing how that Israel understands the identity of this threat when so many Western Bible prophecy scholars, uh, so-called uh, Bible prophecy teachers, do not. Uh, 42 months or 1260 days, which can only make sense when it's because he gave it to us in months and days, when it's counted as each month being 30 days. Not the Western calendar, which, you know, where, you know, we can't decide whether a month ought to be 28 days, 30 days, or 31 days. 1260 days, 42 months, roughly three and a half years. You see that over and over and over again all through the Bible. It's repeated. So I don't think it's symbolic. Now that puts me in the 70th week of Daniel. The question before us here is... Are these 42 months that we're reading about here the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel or, or are they the last half? The 70th week of Daniel ends at the end of the 70th week. And that's why I've tried to point out the church as an interruption in that or a parenthesis, but not a consummation of it. So this is half of that last final week, the 70th week of Daniel. The question is, is it the first half or the second? In the 10th chapter, we, look, we, we saw, we were introduced to some of the things that happened in the first half. Now we see the temple measured. And that 42 months has ran, so we are at the middle of the week. That's the way I see it. And I will give authority or power to my two witnesses that they shall prophesy 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. Same with, same with wearing the same thing as John the Baptist. That's during the same 42 months that the Gentiles tread down the outer court. I think we're in the first half of the tribulation period. You don't have to agree with that, but that's how I'm looking at that. These are described as two olive trees and lampstands which stand before the God of the earth. Even though they're not named here, you know, if you, if you read all the commentaries, if you digest all the literature, uh, there are two basic candidates, primary candidates, Enoch and, and Elijah, or Moses and Elijah. Whoever they are, they're, they're killed. When their ministry is, is complete, they're killed. But wouldn't they have once died already? I thought it wait, I thought it was appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment, isn't that what it it says in Hebrews? Well, I think that in Hebrews when it says it's appointed unto men once to die, that's spiritual death. Our death in Adam. So people may die physically twice. I think that Lazarus did that. People get mad at me when I say that. I don't think God gave Lazarus a glorified body. I think he probably died again. It is appointed unto men once to die, but I believe that's a spiritual death. The word man is anthropos, which is used for mankind in, in general, the whole of mankind, the human race. Keep in mind, Satan was out there looking for Moses' body. I think it was because, and this is just my personal opinion, I think it was because he figured that 
if he could find it, it might interfere with God's plan for Moses to be one of the two witnesses. You know, you don't have to agree with that. I'd, I'd caution you about agreeing with me on anything, but I'm going to tell you what I think. That's all I can do. Doesn't make me right. No, no man has a handle on the truth. Okay? Y'all need to study this book for yourself to see if these things be so. Draw your own conclusions. I hope in some way I can help. Okay? But don't just believe something just because Steve believes it. That's dangerous. I think it's Moses and Elijah. And I think they've been there a long time. The perfect tense says, you know, they are standing before the God of the earth. Well, how long have they been standing? Well, the perfect tense for you Greek students out, out there, you know, it that says they've been standing a long time. And when they finish their testimony, they're slain which is why the perfect tense is used as an argument to say it's got to be uh, Moses and Elijah. They've been there a long time. We see them on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, so it isn't that these two just, you know, popped onto the scene out of nowhere. They've been standing before the God of the earth a long time. And, you know, and many of you know where I stand on the issue of time versus eternity you know, in which there is no, time doesn't exist. Uh, eternity is not just an ex, uh, an extension of time, but a, uh, an entirely different dimension. But that's another subject. Uh, don't even want to begin to go down that, 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 that road here in this video. Folks, uh, They've been standing for a long time, is what the text says. And they are light bearers. That's, you know, they're not the, of course, they're not the light itself. Christ is the light of the world. But these are light bearers. Okay? In a, in a period of a time of darkness, they're, they're bringing light. So they stand there, they stand there, they're, even now they are standing before God. They're placed, they are, they've been placed there by God. Now we've got a grammatical problem. If any man will hurt them, if any man will hurt them, if any man desires to hurt them, okay, is what the text is saying. Fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. But, and if you consider this is a, when you take into account this is a first class condition in the Greek, what that says, folks, is it says that if you decide you're going to kill them or hurt them, you're going to die. That's what the text is saying. You haven't even done anything yet. You haven't even, you haven't, you haven't even uh, tried to hurt them. You just, you're just thinking about it. Okay? You just made a decision. You made the decision that you're going to hurt them and bang, you get burned up. Okay, that's what the text says. If any man will hurt them, he must in this manner, what manner? By fire, be killed. You don't even want to think about, uh, you don't even want to think evil about these guys. Okay, these are powerful guys. They seem to even know what you've decided to do. And when they have finished their work, the beast that ascends out of the abyss... That's the one that rises out, comes up out of the abyss, not, not the sea, not the earth, out of the abyss, shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. That's why I think we're in the first half of the 70th week. In chapter 13, we'll see two other beasts. We'll see one rising up out of the sea, the other coming up out of the earth. That's you know, distinct from the beast that ascends out of the abyss and kills the two witnesses which I believe is Satan. It's got to be Satan. You know, the word abyss, you know, you look at that in, in, your, in the dictionary, the Greek dictionary, it's, it it's, describes a, a place, it's the place of the dead uh, and evil spirits. We see in chapter 20, this, if we go ahead to Revelation, we look in chapter 20, we'll see 
that this same one is thrown back into the abyss for a thousand years. Okay? It's where Satan's bound for a thousand years. The abyss. So I believe Satan is the one that kills these two witnesses. That I think the two beasts of chapter 13 that rise up out of the sea and the earth, I think these are human, okay? Uh, either individuals or, or, or systems. So God allows Satan to do what no man was able to do, which is kill the two witnesses. And that, that shouldn't come as any a shock to any other. Satan is a, is a murderer. He's a liar. He's a lot of things, but he's a murderer. He murdered Abel uh, through Cain. He allowed, uh, uh, he, God allowed Satan to instigate the crucifixion of Christ, even though it was, it was preordained, decreed by God before the foundation of the world. It's always been about thwarting God's plan, plans and purposes. Okay. So for 1260 days, the, the testimony of these two torments the people on earth. The world is tormented by these two. The text makes it crystal clear as to the location where this takes. It's it's in Jerusalem. It's not in Washington D.C. or Moscow or Paris or or London. It's in Jerusalem, and he kills them. Now, how he does it, how Satan does it, I don't know. But the text makes it clear: the beast rising out, up out of the abyss kills them, and because he does. Those who don't know the Lord eagerly follow, guess who? Satan. Though I, I, I seriously doubt that most uh, know it's Satan that they're really following. The text, our, our, the, the, our Bibles folks say that God sends upon them strong delusion that they might believe a lie. If you look at that in the original text, it's that they might believe what is false, okay, Uh, and if, if we go over to, to Second Thessalonians chapter two, where it talks about uh, the Antichrist being revealed, uh, that he destroys with the brightness of his coming, it says, "Whose coming is after the working of Satan." That's the the Antichrist possesses. Satan possesses the Antichrist. He's, it's after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Okay? Uh, and for this cause, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe what is false, which is also a strong case in support of a pre-trib rapture. We know that one of the two purposes for the book of Revelation is to deal with the nation Israel. The other, those who have made the earth their place of permanent abode. Everything is about the here and now. There's no thought about the hereafter. It's all about, you know, some new utopia or something. You know, self-seeking, self-serving. You know, they've made the earth their permanent abode. Which is why I think you know, it's, I find it odd that any Christian would want to take and focus on things below, not on things above. But that's another subject, too. Uh, so we're looking here, we're looking at God dealing with Israel. He's dealing with the nation of Israel. The temple is measured. We, we see the two witnesses, a rebuilt temple, the two lampstands. Even now, standing before the God of the earth, perfect tense, they've been standing there a long time. Uh, I don't believe that they would feel like that it's been a long time to them, but you know, as far as I, time, our being in time, in, from our perspective, it's been a long time. We read in Deuteronomy it's, uh, that the Lord is going to send a prophet like unto Moses, and the normal approach to that verse is that's, that that's Christ. And that's probably right. But those who want to make Moses 
one of the candidates refer to that verse and then they say you know it may in some sense refer to christ but it also may refer to moses who was brought back at this time uh, then of course you have in malachi elijah you know uh who is going to come just before the great and terrible day of the lord before the day of the lord now i i've, I've wondered a lot about that i it's to to read that he's going to appear before the great and terrible day of the lord would lead you to automatically just assume well he's going to he he what the text must be saying is that he must be going to appear before while we're still here before the day of the lord before the tribulation period i don't think that's the case i don't think that's what that's saying it's either talking about the great tribulation the second half he appears before then or he appears within this 30-day uh, interlude between the rapture and the beginning of Daniel's 70th week, which I've pointed out in past videos. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe Satan didn't want to... Uh, God to use Moses. I, I know I'm reading the white spaces there. And, and maybe we're seeing Moses used here. There's a lot of technical discussion as to who these two individuals are. But since God doesn't tell me who they are, I'm going to just tell you what I think. I think they're Moses and Elijah. But that doesn't make me right. Uh they prophesy for a set period of time, clothed in sackcloth, then they die. Their bodies lie dead in the street for three and a half days. Then they rise to life. They're caught up to heaven, and the world is terrified. The whole world saw them lie in the street. And my, my grandpappy would have said, well, how in the world did the whole world see that? Well, we know how they do that, satellite TV. You know, I can just hear Fox News telling, you know, people what these two witnesses said. You know, those two people in Jerusalem were saying God's coming back and, you know, God's going to judge you, you know. I just sometimes, you know, I, I just let my mind wander a little bit in the white uh, spaces. I try not to in the black spaces. I think Christ spoke to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus about himself, about Moses, and the prophets, and he might even, maybe a portion of that dealt with uh, the impending judgment. I don't know. Uh, I know John the Baptist preached the kingdom of heaven was at hand, and I know that Jesus offered the kingdom, to, to, came offering himself as king and offering the kingdom to Israel. Uh, so my personal opinion is that the ministry of the two witnesses is no different. I think the beast that rises out of the abyss is Satan. The beast that rises up out of the sea is the Antichrist. And I, and I think the one that rises up out of the earth probably represents the army of the Antichrist. But these two are clothed in sackcloth. They look like John the Baptist. I think that's literal. And they give forth the word of God, but the nations don't want that. You know, mankind would would like uh, some assurance of safety, and they don't see it in Christ. You know, if we had some charismatic figure who rose up and guaranteed world peace, I believe the major portion of the U.S. and and other nations would would follow him. We're going to see that this beast demands they receive a seal of some kind. Okay? Well, of course, God's people refuse that. They don't really refuse to accept that mark of the beast. Now, I believe it is the number of a man. Okay? But I think that Bible prophecy teachers, Bible students, Bible uh, uh, even so many of the so-called experts, I believe that they have read that wrong. 
I believe it is the number of a man. Okay? But I believe that man that it's referring to is associated with a particular religion. Okay? That it's swearing allegiance to that particular religion. Which they willingly do. And that it is not to avoid being killed because they actually adore this creep. Okay? They, they worship the beast. And, and yet, those who refuse to worship him are killed. Fire proceeds out of the mouth of these two witnesses. Now, you can say that that's, well, that's the words they speak. They're, they're speaking fire, and, and somehow those words kill them. Seriously? I, I, now, you can do that if you want. I, I think it's fire. It doesn't amaze me that God could have fire come out of their mouth. Uh, and the text is clear. If someone just desires to hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours them. You know, it's not that they're punished by some kind of rhetoric. You know, I don't... Folks, uh, uh, sometimes it's hard to just simply take God at what, he's, what He said. Okay? God says fire. They're slain. They're destroyed, consumed by the, the fire it comes out of their mouth. Uh, I, I keep in mind these two are, are able to, to stop the rain, is is cause it not to rain. They have they have great authority and power. Okay, this is not some ordinary time. Uh, I know we can we can spend a lot of time trying to spiritualize a lot of this stuff. Uh, and, and your mind can go in all kinds of directions with that. I think it's literal. I think fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours them. That's what I think. They have power to shut heaven uh, where it doesn't rain in the days of their prophecy. Elijah had that power, so there are those that say this must be Elijah. They have the authority to, to shut heaven so it doesn't rain uh, for, for that three and a half years. They have that authority. Now, there's no indication that they use it in the text, okay? And this is, you know, I, I'm just wanting you folks to be careful here, okay? There's no, nothing in the text says that they actually do this. You, you need to, this is why we need to slow down, okay? There's no indication in the text that they actually use it. The text won't allow us to say for sure that they use it, but they have the power to do so. And we find that when they're killed, the whole world rejoices. It seems more likely that the, the joy of seeing them dead is because of their prophecies dealing with God's judgment. They also have the authority to turn water to blood. Moses had that authority. So that, that might be another evidence that the, this is Moses. Why blood? I mean, why... Why so much blood? Well, you could simply say that the tribulation period is a really bad period and a lot of people are going to die. That means a whole, there's going to be a whole lot of blood and that's all that means, okay? But why is God showing the earth so much blood? Not. And I've suggested it's because they regarded the blood of the covenant as unholy as we read in Hebrews. Same with the bitter Wormwood, poisonous, toxic water. They refuse the water of life. Uh, so you can spiritualize this to some extent. But I still don't, I don't see, even if the fire coming out of their mouth was rhetoric or judgment or just even the Word of God, I don't see how that that I don't see how that that would consume their their adversaries. I just don't see how that. Uh, I think we can only go push that symbolism so far. Uh, when they're caught up to heaven, there's an earthquake that destroys a tenth of the city. Seven thousand people dead. I believe that number is literal. 
I don't have any other reason to take it as anything other than literal. They also have the authority to cause all kinds of plagues on the earth. Okay, and no, we're not there yet, I don't think. We, this might be, corona might be, uh, you know, something that's sort of a precursor to, you know, to, to this, but we're not there yet. I, and I don't know if they cause any plague. The only, only thing that we know for certain is that they have the authority to do that. And when they finish their testimony, when they have finished their testimony, when they have finished their testimony, and I could preach an entire sermon on that, until you have finished your testimony, you can't be killed. You can't be harmed. God has laid out your life. When they have finished their testimony, until then, nobody could kill them. They were invincible. And if, if they even thought about hurting them, they were destroyed. But when they finished their testimony, Satan, by whatever means, overcomes them and kills them, doing God a service when he does. Seems to be another sermon in that. Their dead bodies lying in the street of the city of Jerusalem, Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified, so we know that to be Jerusalem. Uh, I generally try and stay out of politics, but I'll say this. If you can see how that the globalists and their lust for power are angry because of our right to, to want to freely ex express our, our beliefs, which they plan to eradicate, my, how far we've strayed from truth and common sense and how close we've come, I believe, to the day that we've been looking forward to. Just how angry do you think the world will be toward the sovereign God of the universe when His judgment falls upon them? These two witnesses, represented by olive trees, you know, as olive trees and candlesticks. That's 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 oil and light. The the olive trees were where they get the oil for the the the, the candlestick. You know, the it's one complements the other. One helps the other. It's uh, the light of the Holy Spirit. Okay, to ensure that the ministry of the Holy Spirit continues after this, listen to me, after the Holy Spirit departs this earth in the body of Christ, the church of the living God in this age of grace. That's it. And until then, as, or as long as we are here, folks, none of this can kick in. It's not hard to see that that it it is it will be most likely our being taken out that ushers all of this in. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Thank you. I want to say thank you to all of you who continue to watch these these videos on these uh, what many others would probably consider. The most most boring studies through Revelation or through any book of the Bible that, that you're interested it thrills me to death that you people, folks are interested in growing in in your understanding of the word and fellowshipping together in this way uh, I, I love and appreciate all your comments I, I I sincerely ask you for your prayers for the, you know, the continued direction of this ministry until next time Thanks for watching.